Good afternoon. My name is Brian Real, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Process Maker. Today is an emotional day for me, a special day. I am so proud and so excited to be here to personally introduce the launch of the latest version of our flagship product, Process Maker. We launched Process Maker as an open source product in 2008. I can still remember well the day we launched. I was so nervous. I didn't really know what to expect. Our basic premise was that workflow and workflow software was just too difficult and needed to be simplified. We saw open source as both a way to disrupt and simplify the world of workflow software. And so Process Maker was born. The truth is, not too much happened in those first days. It was not easy starting Process Maker. I really should post some of the pictures of our first office. It was pretty bad. There were just four of us that day in 2008 when we uploaded the first version of Process Maker to SourceForge. It took us a few years of product iteration to begin to really see user traction with our open source product. But we persevered, and within a few years, we had 500 people per day downloading our product. Fast forward to 2020, and today we have grown to 150 employees and more than 400 enterprise customers worldwide. We continue to grow very fast, continue to be profitable, and privately owned. I am very happy and proud of our position as a company today. We like to say that Process Maker is designed for organizations to automate form-based approval-driven processes that connect people, data, and systems to produce better outcomes. We've been striving to produce the easiest to use enterprise-grade workflow system in the world. By enterprise grade, we mean that this is a system designed to help businesses to solve complex and unique business problems that require high levels of reliability and security. These are also processes that tend to integrate with core ERP and CRM systems, as well as homegrown systems, basically systems of record at the company. Process Maker has improved by leaps and bounds since 2008. Today is our fourth major product launch, Process Maker 4.0. But this product launch is different. It is our biggest, boldest product launch ever. This time we really did it right. We spent almost three years reimagining what our product could and should become. We've reviewed where we have been as a company. We've reviewed important feedback from all of you, our loyal customers over the years. And we looked closely at the market and where we think technology is headed. We asked ourselves how new trends in robotic process automation, integration, low code, and the Internet of Things would impact digital transformation in the years to come. We realized that it was time to release a new type of technology, a technology that could provide our clients with a true competitive advantage in the market. We asked ourselves the core question, what does Process Maker have to look like to become the innovation engine for organizations in this next decade so that they can reliably get ahead and stay ahead and transform their digital strategy. We wanted to rebuild based on new concepts of automation, security, and we wanted to prepare, be prepared for the massive volumes of data that our customers are now expecting and experiencing on a daily basis. We also recognized that users want to fall in love with their business software in the same way they fall in love with the apps on their phones. We wanted Process Maker to be that beautiful and truly elegant piece of business software that you use. The one where you look and think, wow, that's just really well done. We were creating a new type of low-code solution. The result of all our research and development can be summed up in one term, Process Maker 4. I'd like to give a big shout out to our engineering and product teams who, under the leadership of our CTO, Taylor Dondich, have really worked some, some magic in this product. I, you'll, you'll see it and you will know what I'm saying shortly. I have no doubt that you're going to be blown away by what we have produced. Here's a little of what you'll see. We're still delivering the familiar ease of use that you have come to know and love in Process Maker. However, under the hood, our engineering is totally different. You'll see new levels of performance thanks to an asynchronous real-time engine that can now process huge loads of data by efficiently using background job queues. You'll see a new ability to, to develop your own connectors to the systems you most use and then deliver those connectors as low-code packages to the business analysts and teams in your organizations. 
you'll see a full business activity monitor, or BAM, now bundled with our product to provide true agility and real-time monitoring of service level agreements across your processes. You'll see new levels of usability and consistency throughout our interface. You'll see a completely redesigned interface that is just beautiful from start to finish. You'll see a new multi-page forms tool, forms design tool that we call our screen designer. Developers will find that they can now develop custom scripts in any programming language they choose. You'll see a true API first, mobile first design based on microservices and you'll see enterprise security and scalability. Yes, it is truly awesome. I've seen a lot of workflow products and I can honestly say that Process Maker is the most elegant, well-designed and agile product in the market today. Okay, I'm a little biased, but I think you'll agree once you see it. You're absolutely gonna love it. So with that intro and all of my emotions bubbling up, I want to introduce my esteemed and often humorous colleague, Jose Maldonado, Director of Solution Engineering. He will take us on a tour of this wonderful product, and I'm sure you'll agree with me that what we've produced is something truly amazing. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that intro, Brian. And yeah, I agree. It's super exciting to be here and to have this opportunity to share um, with everyone all the fun stuff that we've been working on that our engineering and product teams have been putting together. So give me one second while I um, spin up my browser window and share my screen. And any moment now, you should be seeing my browser. Now, as I log in um, as an admin user, just so we can start and go, going over a few of, uh, of the uh, interface elements that we'd like to show, uh, let me take this opportunity to sort of offer uh, just an idea of, of what to expect and what it is that we've been focusing on. And, and the whole spirit of this is that we've worked um, a lot in trying to just enhance the experience for all the, 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 the stakeholders that participate um, in our workflows. And uh, this involves all the different roles that interact. And for each of these, we have uh, awesome new features and just new, new, new uh, a new thought out experience, custom designed to, to really improve the way how the things work. And this includes everyone from, you know, uh, business managers or, or process analysts that need to understand how these workflows are behaving. They want to know, you know, uh, how what's going on how can they just you know zoom into the piece of information and, and peel back layers of data navigate that and be prompted into what needs their attention and this includes uh just you know real-time alerts and notifications of things that that are happening live and that require intervention but also scheduled you know reports of of added information of what of what's going on uh, all the way to other roles like um, business designers and modelers who put together workflows um, for their organizations they'll going they're going to love our new features of just the libraries of reusable assets that they can put together very easily um, in a very visual uh, driven experience in a great uh, inter interface that will just streamline their productivity in, in putting together these building blocks and stringing them together into reusable assets for end an, an users. Um, and this includes also for developers or, or technical folks who want to extend our platform uh, using their own custom scripts. They want to lift the hood and leverage our, our scripting capabilities to create their own connectors, to create their own integration points to bring data in and out uh, and they'll love the capability of using uh, the, the programming languages that they already know and are comfortable with and to use um, all the features of reusability and scalability and cloud architecture designed for that um, and on that note just not just for developers but for the tech crowd in general just the, the stability and the scalability of our new api driven architecture is going to be a huge draw um, and all the way you know just to to the the stars of the show which are our, our end users 
And these are really uh, the most benefit because these, you know, these are the folks who, who want to just get in, get stuff done, and get on to the next thing. Um, those are they are the ones who participate on the workflows that are have been put together, and they're going to appreciate just how easy it is to find out what they need to do uh, and have multiple ways to access it. And, and keep these things moving. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So let me just roll it back. And you know we're here in, in Process Maker, and hopefully we're going to uh, touch through a few examples of these different roles and use cases as I um, have just laid out. So I logged in as an admin user. This is just a, a good place to start to understand sort of the navigational pieces. Mm. And this, um, this is what we're seeing here is sort of our new home inbox view. And I'll take a time to better explain some of the key uh, UI elements that we want to bring attention to. Uh, but yeah, so when, when, when for you're first logged in, you're greeted by a customizable view of what it is that you want to track as a user. And this can include all sorts of stuff in terms of the you know requests of workflows that are you're, that um, you're interested in or that you're monitoring. Um, and all sorts of stuff. But actually, I want to just, you know, let's do a quick sort of walkthrough of the interface. So up here, we have our main navigation menu. Here are the primary sections uh, where, where different uh, participants will find access to different things. So uh, depending on role, and of co course, everything is uh, based on permissions and so on and so forth. So of course, I'm the admin. I have access to all modules. So different use cases will see different things, but basically, you know, requests and tasks. This is where end users will find their day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, the designer tab is where business modelers and designers will put together those workflows for their end users. Uh, all the admin is where we can do the configuration of the platform. You know, create users and groups and configure things like uh, like um, our our. Uh, SAML connectors, our interface uh, definition, uh, customization, and so on, and all, all sort of the goodies for just the admin and, and settings of, of the application. Um, we have a full, fully fledged collections module, which is sort of a repository of, of uh, information where you can store and retrieve information outside of the scope of individual workflows. Um, so something that's similar to an internal database uh, conceptually, although it's all, um, and I, again, just getting ahead of myself, it's all uh, schema-less. But, but yeah, it's a repositories of information that you can leverage ac across your processes. So I'll, I'll unpack these concepts as we go along. Um, we have a start a request uh, button over here at our, our top right, and this allows uh, just to manually fire off workflows as we're as we're interested to. We have a notification bell, and as things start happening, we'll see this um, firing off different messages for us. Our, our settings and preferences and profile administration for for the role. And then over here to the right, we have sort of our contextual uh, shoulder menu. Uh, sorry, at the left, and and this will of course change in re reference to whatever it is that we're seeing in our main section, and then the the overall just content here uh, is displayed, you know, front and center. Uh, our home view has different counters, and all of this can be customized. So we'll come to that into in a second. I want to start by um, switching gears into the designer tab so we can probably bring home the idea of what I'm trying to explain here. So here we have a request change of major. It's fully fleshed out. Let's just open it real quick on, on a design view. And let me just tuck away these uh, edit menus so we can see it clear. So notice it's a very clean design where we see our, our workflow. We understand how it's supposed to behave and what it's supposed to do. And and you know as we unpack and, and select each element, we can see you know how it's put together. Now, on a high level, uh, let's just walk through this process real quick. This is a request change of major, so it's a process part of our higher ed uh, template package. And this is you know a student that's enrolled to a to a program wants to transfer into something else. 
Conceptually, it's a pretty simple process. It will start, the start event is tied to a student filling out a request form. Once the students submit this, the, the request is routed into an advisor who will basically review the form and you know who the advisor is will depend on what the information has been filled on and, and so on. And basically will capture a response from that advisor. That response is then evaluated on a decision gateway. If the advisor uh, did not approve it and that if he did not sign off on this, um, we're going to route into a denial end state, basically, you know, letting the student know that his request has not been fulfilled or approved. Uh, if it was approved, then yeah, it's going to route into a program chair where we have another approval. This one in, from a different form, just to highlight different you know ways to to uh, interact with our end users. The first um, the first sort of approval task is just a straight form that's been displayed in app. So the advisor would navigate to process maker and fill out the form. The second example is driven through an actions by email task. One of our, you know, custom, um, packages here that we have already you know, pre-built and, and actions by email actually sends, uh, the, the, the information to an email, uh, message that can be replied directly from the email client and that way we can capture a response and the participant does not need to log into anything they just need to reply the message uh, appropriately and we'll see that in a few in a few minutes based on that response we can also just send to a denial state or we can uh, route into another task and this task is a connector so over here if you'll remember we have data connectors, which are one of the building blocks that we mentioned, uh, and I'll show it to that to you in, in a second, um, where we can just configure different uh, integration points. So in this example, what we're, we're doing is we're firing off a data uh, connector that's pre-configured against just basically uh, DocuSign's platform for e-signatures. And what's interesting about that, let me just open real quick here, our, our data connectors. So we can see what that is. This allows, as I as I sort of touched upon earlier, this allows for appropriate technical roles to create those sort of um, connection pieces that will bring our workflow information uh, into other services and you know get information back. Uh, and it's extremely useful and it's extremely easy to set up. Over here we have our DocuSign connector. So all we had to do was, was just, you know, understand that the target API and, you know, how do we uh, authorize against it? What are the endpoints? So anyone who, you know, is familiar with their API and that connection will, able, will be able to set this up. And once it's set up, then our process analysts and designers they don't care about the details. They just can leverage this and use it in their process. Uh, we have our other sample connectors here that we'll see in a second. Um, for instance, you know, we have a university system uh, ERP connector, which is mocking a lookup. In, in this example, we're getting information uh, from a Google spreadsheet to find out information from students. So, you know, if we need to bring information from Salesforce, from an ERP, from a spreadsheet, uh, any all these sorts of stuff can easily be put together through data connectors. What's interesting also is this these can be preview just like everything in our platform. It can be tested independently without actually running through example. I don't need to add this connector to a workflow just to understand if it works as expected. I can test it right here and there. Now, of course, this is a JSON response that'll only make sense to, you know, someone who's proficient enough of understanding what the API is, is supposed to do. But from a, from a end user perspective, this is, you know, is functional. We know that it responds and then an appropriate designer can take this input and um, just you know react to it accordingly and appropriately in, in their workflow designs. So that's what we're doing here. We're firing off um, with a DocuSign connector, just a signature uh, from the Dean, and then the process ends. So my idea for the next couple of minutes is let's just run through an example and see this in action, and hopefully that'll help 
drive home the point of what's going on at, at, at each of these stages. And if, if time allows, we can maybe come back and just modify this a little bit, just to shuffle things here live, um, add a couple of modifications and see you know, how that will behave, which will hopefully serve to show not just how easy it is to customize, but also how easy it is to add um, feature-rich things. Um, Meaning, you know, to 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 modify s simply is not necessarily just to do simple things, but rather pretty complex and, and interesting things that are just, um, you know, offered uh, very very accessibly for our for our uh, end users. So let's let's try this out. Let me just show you, or rather, let me just bring your attention to a couple of things that I want to be um, just to keep an eye out while we do our, 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 our quick run through. The first thing is you'll notice that, you know, the start event is in itself just a filter request form. This is because this is driven through a concept that we call the web entry. And this allows us to take just those forms and screens that we saw a few seconds ago, a few minutes ago, and publish them as self-standing assets that can then be um, embedded into just anywhere to fire off our request. So I can just as easily uh, over here, you know, here, here we have a web entry. I could copy this and add it to my um, browser screen. And here we have our change of major request. This is the first form or screen of the process, and it's a self-standing. And this in of itself works, but we can also just feed this into a third-party sort of place where we can integrate it or host it or uh, embed it into an existing system or an intranet site or any portal. We can leverage um, single sign-on for just shared authentication purposes. Uh, so it's pretty interesting how we can just offer this experience outside of Process Maker, not just confined to our application. So we'll see that in a second. Um, other than that, let's just keep an eye on eye out on maybe yeah how these email blasts are sent but that's pretty much it so um for instance i already have i already took this uh, link that we have here and added it to this mock website so this is just a mock website for our our sample school pb university and it's a very common use case where basically you know you have a set of options that can fire off these requests so over here you know we have some student services that they include course registration change of major you know get your transcripts so of course all of these uh, map to one of those processes that we saw on the back end that are driving our, our higher ed package. So what that means is if I click on my request of change of major, this is the same form that we were just seeing. But now, of course, it's tied into um, into the um, into our website. So for demo purposes, you know, we've sort of pre-filled some of this information, so I don't punch it. I have my email. Uh, account my my phone number account in case we just add some notifications uh, but this yeah so Stu the student wants to change programs he's enrolled in computer science apparently um, let's see so notice also that we can very easily uh, you know add custom logic to our um, forms so for instance if I change the uh, the program I'm going to get a different advisor um, so let's say that Mr. Um, Stu student, yeah, wants to get into music. This means that the advisor of the appropriate pro advisor would be Miss uh, Penny Professor. So she'll be sort of taking that advisor role for this process. I'm going to go ahead and confirm this. Um, you know, do you agree that this is going to happen? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and send that. So once this is done, you know, the 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 first part of student experience is over. And now, if you remember our process design. We need to uh, access this process as the professor. So the student has submitted. The process is now in flight. And now it's sent. It, it, the request um, is waiting at the uh, advisor uh, stage for uh, intervention. So let's just log out from here and come back as um, our professor and see what that looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and log in as Give me a sec as our professor. And what do we have here? So this is a pretty similar experience, if a little watered down, because of course this role does not have access to everything that we've seen.
Mm. So, uh, a few things worth mentioning. Notice how, you know, I'm tracking, I'm not just tracking um, just information that relate to myself, but also here on the notification bell. Yeah, I just got a notification a few seconds ago that a review form is pending my intervention. And this is in relation to a request change of major process that's been uh, recently fired off. And I, of course, before I hit that notification, we can also see it on our, on our task to-do list. And this is a list of all the different things that this user has pending. Notice how a few of these are actually overdue um, and they're color coded. And this is reacting to that due date um, box that we saw a while back on the design stage where you can define how long should your tasks take. And these can drive all sorts of, of, of information. And of course, these views can be customized and whatnot, but uh, I'll, I'll try to stay away from that just for now because for time purposes, but it's a great way to just keep in touch of what it is that you need to be um, aware of. Um, only to be, you know, real quick, maybe, you know, if I want to see uh, everything that is uh, pending, but not just in general, but specific about core selection, I can do some filterings. Of course, I know I just click on, on anything, nothing that I have will meet this criteria. What's interesting about what we're seeing now is this is driven by a new concept that we call uh, process maker query language. If I click on advanced mode, I can actually see the underlying query statement that is being that is driving the filtering that we're seeing over here. And this is pretty useful because using this sort of interface, we can create just all sorts of, of, of filters of information that we want. So, for instance, I could just come ahead and and add if I'm if I'm proficient in process maker query language, you know, show me everything that not just is in progress, but that is, um, you know, that the due date is is passed. So notice that now I added a filter here, and this only matches those that are um, expired. And I can just go a step further and save this search. Just to just call it, you know, my expired tasks and this is a way for users to customize what it is that they want to keep an eye on um, i'm going to add the little flame here because that sounds like something i need to keep attention on i could share this with other different users so maybe i create it uh, as an admin or as a designer and i want to sort of uh, propagate this this uh, view this filter the safe search to other users so i'm going to hit and save it which means that once i refresh my tasks list notice that over here i got a new icon called my expired tasks and now when i click on it um i get the view that i that i just saw so this is a quick way of customizing what it is that you know we want to be mindful of and there are whole lots of different new features that I can't don't have time to, to just unpack right now but these include stuff like you know uh, sending this list as a report so we can schedule uh, you know send me this set of, of tasks that are expired um, every Monday morning send it to me and to my manager or not, you know, on a scheduled basis, but an actual uh, alert uh, trigger basis. So we can subscribe it as a notification, which means that every time a new request matches this filter, meaning in this example that it becomes expired, fire off a new notification. So, so we have sort of that dual aspect where we can create scheduled reports, but we can also create uh, alerts that react real time to information that's happening. So I'm letting, I'm getting a, a little derailed because there's so much fun stuff that I like to show, but let's go back to the review form that Mr. Uh, sorry, Miss Penny professor needs to uh, address. So here we have a sort of a similar screen to the one that we just saw from the student. Of course, this one is, is read only for the most part, because I can't change the request information, but we have the information that we need namely that, you know, Stu, the student, um, is interested in transferring from computer science into music. So here, I'm going to go ahead and, for time purposes, let's be quick, I'm going to agree and sign. I could opt for different, for something else, but let's just move forward. And this, if you remember, our design is going to uh, send the program chair 
an email notification that I have pre-approved this and that they need to sort of sign it off before it goes into the Dean. So let's just get that going. I'm going to go ahead and approve. So as a, as a user experience, pretty simple for me to find what I need to focus on, get it done, submit it, and move on. I'm going to go ahead and log out. And the next task is email driven. So I'm going to come in here into my demo email account and then Let's just wait for a few seconds for the uh, actions by email to come in. Okay, so notice how immediately since I clicked on the uh, notifications tab, I got tons of notifications of all the expired tasks uh, that, that we're tracking. So this is, you know, we sort of turned on a switch of send me a real time notification every time we have a expired tasks and also notice here that as a chair of course this is one sort of demo account so i'm sending all uh, demo um, emails from diff to different um, contacts actually to the same account but you know as the chair we got our our um, notification that says hey a change of major request has been pre-approved and here notice that this is i i'm still on my gmail account right and here is a very uh, similar screen but it's, it's directly on my on my email message i have the information that i want so yeah a student has requested the transfer penny professor has already pre-approved this check it out so here i see you know i can email the student right here then and there um, and i have these sort of action buttons that are driving the next action i can reply with continue or reply with reject and what's interesting is you know if i click on reply to continue what this is going to do is just just send an an an, uh, an email account that we're monitoring that the that process maker is monitoring for a response so replying with continue and this is useful because we're not doing any sort of custom work custom plugins this is a straight message reply that's analyzed by process maker what this means is that you know users can use any email client and server and infrastructure that they have and if they can receive and send messages they will be able to participate with um, action driven emails so it's pretty cool so once this is done basically the process is going to snooze and wait uh, for that response to be captured and use that to um and use that to to understand what needs to happen so while we get that response let me just come back here as the admin and that way we can sort of peek into what the request is uh is looking like so over here you know we have our latest you know request change of major process so i'm going to go ahead and you know see where where it's at and yeah we can see that the request started from a web entry penny professor completed the task and now what's going on is sort of the action by email sub process so let's just wait for a response here where we know that um, the process uh, is moving forward and here it is so first we got a reply from process maker saying yep we got your answer so this lets us know that you know whatever we replied in, in this example just to continue we receive that and then subsequently this is going to move the process forward and if you remember that's basically the dean doing the DocuSign piece and sure enough here I got a message as the Dean and this message is sent by DocuSign so this is our data connector in action that received the process and fired off the request to DocuSign um, we don't need to fulfill the entire DocuSign piece uh, just, I'm just going to show it to you how we can also, you know, send information via the API. So notice how this is, we're part, we're now in DocuSign's platform and all the information of our request just made its way into uh, our piece for, for our signature. And this is being driven, if you remember, let's just come back here to our designer and uh, preview and review uh, request change of major. What, um, what happened here? And so, yeah, this is this Dean E signature. Uh, so we're getting close to the um, to the hour mark, but I want to see if we have time to put together just you know a couple of of changes to our process. So the first thing that that um, I want to try, I want to try out a couple of different things so we can 
uh, run through the example and and see it in action uh, live a few a few uh, modifications so I want to try two different things basically leveraging some additional uh, uh, additional controls here to just enrich our example. So first thing is I want to send, um, I want to add a script. We haven't used any scripts and scripts are pretty cool because they allow um, appropriate developers to add their own, just, you know, their own calculations, their own business rules or whatever it is that they want to, to, to do. So uh, let's just add a script real quick that will calculate the student's GPA. Now, for demo purposes, we're sort of going to quote unquote hard code it on the script, but it's going to be an actual script so we can see how easy it is to put it together. So to do that, all we need to do is just I'm going to drag a new task over here. And this task is going to be a script task. And I'm going to unplug this task because I want the GPA to happen first. So now uh, it's going to do something like this. And this script is going to basically, you know, get students GPA. Now, the real question is, you know, where are we going to get it? So this is, this is sort of the fun part. Uh, so I'm going to come here into our scripts. And... Here we have scripts of all different natures. And what's interesting for developers is that they can create scripts in uh, different languages. The, the core of our own application, sure, it's PHP, but that has nothing to do with the scripting capabilities that can enrich workflows. So here, for instance, you know, um, we can create PHP scripts, sure, but we also can create JavaScript, C Sharp, Java, R. And this is all because what happens in runtime is that our workflow engine, when it reaches a script task, will spin up a container environment based on a Docker image that has whatever SDK is needed to execute this script. And it sounds a little technical, but bottom line is it's going to spin up a mini environment that has all the needed bells and whistles to run this script. It's going to receive a data object. It's going to do whatever it needs to do and then send a response before it destroying itself. Uh, it's all contained, self-contained, so it's not going to permeate the rest of the workflow. And it can it, it's leveraging all these cloud technologies to scale accordingly. Now, what's pretty cool is that, for instance, um, conceptually, it's not easy to imagine a use case where, you know, we have a straight business application that's leveraging a, an R script so easily because, you know, PHP or, or, or Java is pretty straightforward. So let's just do exactly that. I'm going to uh, create, let's create a one that says, you know, calc GPA, and it's going to be a sample R script. Now, I'll try to be quick and also full disclosure. I am by no means an R developer, so I have no idea what I'm doing. But hopefully, we can uh, we can get it through. So this is our script editor, and sort of the same idea applies, which is you know we have this blank canvas onto which we can start building stuff and test it out. Um, so for for uh, uh, forgive me if I, I don't really get into the details of the actual syntax for R. But hopefully you'll be able to follow along. The first thing that we want to do is just, you know, read the data object that exists in the request. And this is, you know, done by, I'm going to set a variable call output and I'm going to make it uh, equivalent to the data object. So data is going to be sort of a set variable. Never mind if, if this doesn't make any sense. This is not supposed to be a, a demo on how to build R scripts. Just know that we're reading whatever it is that we have on our on our request now let's just create some dummy data so let's say that i took you know my first uh, uh, my first course was calculus and let's say that my grade here was i don't know three uh eight three seven that's fine then we did also did some programming and this um was i don't know let's say that we did three three and finally we maybe took some i don't know some history lessons and that wasn't so uh, nice. So we got a 2.7. So all we're doing here is just declaring some variables according to R's own um, syntax. But you can just as easily imagine how we could do, you know, 
pretty complex stuff and leverage existing data or whatnot. We're not doing any of that right here. Now we just, you know, create a nice uh, little um, vector with all these grades. I'm going to call it grades. And this is going to be um, C is for vector. And this includes our calculus and our programming. Now notice how our IDE is doing autocomplete. So your developer is going to love this. Um, and now I got that now. So the, the, the GPA is basically the mean for grades. And that's pretty cool. And what we want to do is add this to the output object. So basically send this back to the request. That's being done by setting uh, a new variable, part of the output um, vector. And I'm going to call it uh, GPA. So what this is going to do is going to create a new object called GPA. And it's going to set it with whatever you know this function evaluates to. And we can test it right here. Let me just run through it. And it's a very simple script. Never mind if you don't understand what's going on from an R perspective. But do understand a couple of things. First is we are testing this script completely independently from any process. I haven't added it to any workflow. I just open up the designer. And still, I'm able to understand if it's going to behave how I expect. That's pretty useful in of itself. But also note here that you know part of my preview is, yeah, that GPA with those values that you punched in, it's going to read this. And this is going to become part of my data object, which means that you know I can now uh, use it um, in, 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 in other parts of the workflow. So yeah, this is looking great. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And now let's just go back to our process and select our new script. And yeah, here it is, Calc, Calc GPA. Now, of course, it's hard coded, so we don't need to send any configuration, but we can create very rich use cases by sending you know, parameters and whatnot. All that we need to do now is to show that GPA. So over here on a review form, uh, Let's just edit it and, and show the GPA. So I'm going to go ahead and open screen. And here is our, our screen builder for the change of major advisory review. And we already saw this because um, when we went through the first time, all I'm going to do right now is pretty simple. I'm going to modify one of these rich text box. And notice this sort of double squiggly bracket interface is what we call mustache. That's for us to leverage request variables in flight. So here we're going to say, just as, we're just as you're showing me name and email, show me also its GPA. And then I use the squiggly brackets. And then I use whatever variable I know that that's called. And we were called, that's what we were. Uh, outputting from our script. So that alone should work uh, without further uh, testing. I can preview because again, I can I can preview everything and test it uh, independently. So yeah, there it is. Of course, it's blank because we don't have any um, we don't have any GPA uh, as of yet. But let's uh, test it real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And let's run it through it one more time. So let me just double check. Get GPA, review, review. Let's just save this new change and let's try this one more time. So I'm going to come back here to our uh, web entry, request change of major. Everything's the same, but now uh, confirm, send, thank you. So now when I come back, let's just log back out as our professor. Let's see um, what went down. So here in our tasks, oh, no, don't panic. Ah, it's this. And there we go. Here's a stu student, and that's there's the GPA that we just calculated. So it's pretty cool, pretty simple. Um, and let, let me just you know pause there to sort of recap what we did because what's happening here, as simple as it is to create a script that's hard coding a value and, and sending it back, what's interesting to appreciate is that that script is running in an, in an architecture and in a development language that's completely independent from the rest of the application and just in, by the very nature that it's not even a procedural language that's in line with the rest of how process maker is built. So 
don't think of R independently. Think about, you know, it, your, the Java libraries that you need to connect into your own homegrown uh, ERP system or the very, you know, archaic uh, SDKs that you have for C Sharp to connect into some very custom niche application. So now you can leverage those um, assets and the know-how that's already in your team very easily as part of your uh, requests. Finally, um, let's just add one more modification. I promise this is going to be super quick, but it's just another, another example of, of a connector that we can uh, put in place. So let's come back to the designer. Request change of major. Let's revisit this real quick and let's see what we have here. So this is starting to look pretty interesting. Now I want to do just one more. I promise, just one more. Um, but I want to show you the data connectors. So what data connectors do, as I mentioned, is just fire off an API into some external service. So I want to put in together a, a, an API-driven notification um, via an SMS uh, text message, which is pretty you know, common use case in Ask. Uh, now, the backstory for this particular use case came during uh, uh, just a demo that we were doing of a, a similar version of a change of major request. And some of, one of the audience members there said half in jest, uh, you know, never mind notifying the student or the teacher. Um, if I'm the parent, I want to know if my, if my uh, student, if my, if my son is, you know, dropping out of computer science to get into music. So we said, fine, let's put together a, a data alert. Let's just create a notification but let's notify uh, the SMS uh, uh, target the, accordingly. So in order to accommodate that scenario, it's pretty simple. All we need to do in this use case is, um, let's just get rid of this. We already saw that this works. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete it. Now we're just gonna add a data connector, uh, or rather now, uh, we're, let's add a gateway. So the first thing is, let's just ask, you know, are you, um, are you requesting a music major, right? And if if yes, then yeah, we need to we need to tell dad. So I'm going to go ahead and add a data connector and plop it in here. Now let me just make some room here. And yeah. Now my design is a little tight, but yeah, let me just put it over here. Now what's interesting is I can just push this right. Okay. There you go. Um, and then, and then let's just, you know, continue. We don't want to stop the process. Maybe we don't want the student to suspect anything. Just, you know, fire off the notification. Other than that, um, yeah, send it. All right. So, uh, a couple of things to make this work. First is we need to just, you know, make that evaluation. That's pretty straightforward because the way how our gateways work is that we just pick uh, a, an outbound sequence flow and we add an expression. And in this case, we just want to ask, you know, hey, is new major, uh, is new major equal to uh, music? And if that's so, it's going to route uh, over here. And then similarly, we're just going to add sort of a, the, the other scenario. Now, if new major is not equal to music, then yeah, just skip this route entirely. All right. So here, notice we have an exclusive gateway. And yeah, this is kind of tight, but you guys get the idea. Let me just push it all over here, over here. This does not need to be over there. All right. So there we go. There we go. So Yeah, uh, transferring into music. Uh, this is probably okay. So if so, yeah, fire off the data connector. Now, what's interesting is, as we mentioned, our data connector is uh, here. We have all the different data connectors. Here, I have the uh, external SMS platform. This is driven by one of our third-party partners that have all the, the data 
um, the uh, SMS API endpoints. And we've already created a few of them, included, you know, set a custom message, uh, a generic approval or a rejection. But yeah, we already have a data alert, so we don't have to actually customize anything. It's another example how we just, you know, drag and make it part of our process. Um, so yeah, we want to send a data alert if, if uh, Stu here is uh, trying to transfer into music. So, you know, notify dad. Let's just go ahead and save that um, and, and test it out. So in order to test it out, we're going to have to do it. So of course the alerts are tied to my cell phone. So uh, let's do a couple of things here. First, you know, since the process is fired off from here, let me just come back into this um, form. And then in order for us to, to try this, uh, or rather to show this, uh, I'm going to have to share my um, my uh, my mobile screen. Um, so allow me to put that together. It's pretty quick. I just open here a receiver. Give me one second. Let's expand this. And actually, let me just plop it in here real quick. Okay. Uh, we can maybe maybe that's fine. And then. Give me a second. I'm pairing it with my uh, with my phone, and we should be getting something. And okay, I think we're we're good to go. So this is my yeah, it's my Android phone. Um, so let's be quick uh, and let's say yep, I want to do music. Now we already know what's going to happen there. We're going to send. But also, yeah, thank you. So yeah, this is going to notify Penny Professor. But what's going to happen with Dad over here? So hopefully if our process, oh, there you go. Warning, Little Stu is trying to transfer into music. So it's a pretty simple example with just, you know, how pretty quickly with um, with not much intervention. And you know, actually, we can just get rid of this. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so it's pretty cool. So we're already, you know, nearing the end of the hour mark. So I'm going to go ahead and pause there um, and open the mic for any Q and A's. But hopefully, um, we've we've seen some interest interesting stuff. I'm sorry that there's so much cool things that we want to show you that I had to sort of skim through all of them. But um, hopefully, you'll all be excited to start playing with with these to in further detail uh, in the upcoming days and weeks. So with that, I'm going to pause and yeah, open up the mic for some Q&A.